Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We have been waiting for the sonnets of William Shakespeare at the end of this Elizabethan period. As we did for other poets, we will look into the historical and literary context. We will see the Shakespearean sonnet form. We will have a brief introduction to sonnets, the collection of poems published in 1609. We have five poems for you. The first two we will just read them for the sake of joy. Sonnet 12 deals with time and procreation. Sonnet 15 is concerned with poetry for immortality. Sonnet 70, 73 discusses time and mortality. It deals with the theme of death profoundly. Sonnet 16 defines true love which is one of the fantastic poems from Shakespeare. Next we will see sonnet 144 which deals with infidelity and betrayal in human relationships. Shakespeare is great because he was able to deal with various emotions of human beings in such short sonnets in his sonnet sequence called sonnets. If you look into these years that we have given, you will see corresponding actions, historical actions. In 1588, England defeated the Spanish Armada. That was a joy for celebration, but it did not long last. Something happened in England. The outbreak of the plague in London was seen in 1592. It led to the closure of theatres in London in 1592 and 1593. Shakespeare was more into drama, but when his theatre was closed, he used the time to write poems. In 1591, Sydney's sonnet sequence Astrophel and Stella was published. We have many other sonnet sequences after this. In 1592, Henry Constable published his sonnet sequence Diana and Samuel Daniel's sonnet sequence Delia was also published. In the next year, we see Michael Drayton's sonnet sequence Ideas Mirror. Closely, we have Spencer's sonnet sequence Hamerity. And soon after this, in 1603, we find the great loss in England, that is, Queen Elizabeth died, and we see the change of monarchy from Queen Elizabeth to King James I. And in the, after this period, after this only we find the sonnets published in 1609. Something happened in the life of Shakespeare in 1592, 93 or during this decade. It is considered to be a dark time probably for Shakespeare and others as well. When Shakespeare attempted his sonnets, he chose to follow this Shakespearean sonnet form introduced by the Earl of Surrey way back before 1557 through this Tottles miscellany. This particular format has three quatrains and a couplet with 14 lines. It is noticeable that this particular form has alternating rhymes which create a powerful opposition between lines and also quatrains and also indicate 
some kind of progression from one line to another, from one quatrain to another leading to the summary or summation in the couplet. The couplet usually sums up or it may also subvert what is presented in the previous lines. Usually we find that the couplet could stand alone as an epigram that is why many of the couplets from Shakespeare are quotable quotes. Here is the picture of the first edition of the sonnets published in 1609 Shakespeare sonnets first page that is the title page and the front page where the dedication is mentioned. The TT is Thomas Thorpe. This sonnet sequence was dedicated to Mr. W H. We do not know who this person is. A lot of critical effort has gone into find out who this Mr. W H is. Also, a number of critics have attempted to find out the exact order of the sonnets that we have in this collection. It is said these sonnets were published by Thomas Torp without the consent or the knowledge of Shakespeare himself. But these sonnets are wonderful sonnets right from the beginning to the end and they have dealt with all kinds of emotions from human beings. Totally we have 154 sonnets, they were written during the 1590s. We have two major groups in these 154 sonnets. The first one is from 1 to 126. These sonnets are addressed to a person called the fair youth and the second part of this sonnet sequence is addressed to a lady called the dark lady. The exact identity of these characters we do not know. Some conjectures are there of course. Within these 154 sonnets we have some three subgroups. Sonnet 1 to 17 they deal with the procreation theme. We cannot live forever here then how do we find ourselves after our death in on this earth. One way we know is through procreation that is begetting children we pass on our legacy to the future. We have a young man who does not want to get married. So, Shakespeare that is a poet requests the young man get married, procreate, pass on your tradition, your life to others. We also have another subgroup called the rival poet group from 78 to 86. While the young man is a source of joy for the poet that is Shakespeare, the rival poet tries to get attention from the fair youth and also from the lady and so we have a contrast or a competition, a triangle we have, a triangular situation of involving two men and one woman or involving two women and one man is always very complex causing endless sorrow for all the participants in this triangular drama. We have this in this 154 sonnets particularly grouping called the rival poet. The last two poem, poems 153 and 154 are addressed to Cupid the god of love. All these poems deal with the themes of love death, time, poetry, friendship, betrayal, in short the whole of life and death. This sonnet sequence from Shakespeare changed the whole Petrarchan convention of writing sonnets to fair ladies admiring them, always waiting for their response endlessly. But Shakespeare use this sonnet form to address a young man called the fair youth and also he addressed a lady called dark lady not a fair lady. Further we find that this dark lady 
is not chaste or virtuous like the ladies that can be found in other sonnet sequences particularly Petrarch and Dante. Here we find a promiscuous lady who is dark not only in color but also in character. That is why this particular sonnet sequence from Shakespeare has been a mystery and a kind of strange attraction for readers throughout the world. First, we will read the sonnet number 12, which deals with time and also death. When I do count the clock that tells the time and see the brave day sunk in hideous night, when I behold the violet past prime and sable curls all silvered over with white, when lofty trees I see barren of leaves which erst from heat did canopy the herd and summer's green all girded up in sheaves borne on the bier with the white and bristly bird, then of thy beauty do I question make that thou among the waste of time must go since sweets and beauties do themselves forsake and die as fast as they see others grow now nothing against time sight can make defense save breed to brave him when he takes the hands. This is an earnest plea from the poet to his friend the fair youth to understand the unrelenting time, the time that destroys, the time that marches to its last day, endless day, mercilessly, relentlessly, ruthlessly everyone who is subject to time is has to die. So, he tells the young man get married and breed that is reproduce. Here is sonnet number 15 which deals with immortality in poetry of course. When I consider everything that grows holds in perfection but a little moment that this huge stage presenteth not but shows whereon the stars in secret influence common. When I perceive that men as plants increase cheered and checkered even by the self same sky want in their youthful sap at high decrease and wear the brave state out of memory then the conceit of this inconstant stay sets you most rich in youth before my sight where wasteful time debateth with decay to change your day of youth to sullied night and all in war with time for love of you as he takes from you I engraft you new. The poet pleads with the young man who does not seem to be listening and so out of pity for that young man out of love deep aff love and affection for the young man the poet says I engraft you new in my poetry who can win the debate with the decay or the inconstant stay. He refers to the conceit. We can use that idea of inconstancy that is impermanence and understand it ourselves and change ourselves, but what do, what do we do with people who do not understand the power of time. We also observe that Shakespeare the dramatist considers life a stage. This is a huge stage, it presents nothing but shows, we have to play our part. When you are young you get married have children and then life keeps going, who can stop time even if you wish to stop your own life. So, if you happen to have a good friend like Shakespeare he may write a poem for you and immortalize you in poetry. We have three specific examples of sonnets from Shakespeare to discuss in detail. One of the sonnets for discussion is sonnet number 73. It is a very profound poem on the march of death. All of us grow and grow young and old to what? To die, to death. Let us read sonnet number 73 now. That time of year thou mayest in me behold, when yellow leaves are none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold, 
bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. In me thou seest the twilight of such day, as oft sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night doth take away, death's second self that seals up all in rest. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire, that on the ashes of his youth doth lie, as the deathbed whereon it must expire, consumed with that which it was nourished by, this thou perceivest, which makes thy love more strong to love that well which thou must leave ere long. Before we go to the next part of discussion, please look at those highlighted words, particularly the verbs behold, seest in the second quatrain, again seest in the third quatrain, and at last in the couplet perceive, see, behold, behold, see, perceive, see, see, perceive. It is all about perception, ob observation, see death coming, see death as an eternal presence. So, how does Shakespeare present death to us, the reality of death to us, death that we cannot see with our own hands, but we can see the passing of time, the passing of the coming of death, the slowly disappearing of death we can see. From that time of year to the twilight of such day, lastly the glowing of such fire, it is all transition, change, change to the last day of our life. Let us now analyze the poem. The thematic contrast that we have in this poem is all about life and death, implicitly is about love. The theme of time and eternity is what we have, which is contrasted with the theme of love and death. First we see autumn, which is common to nature and human life. At one point of time, we have to face autumn. And then this autumn changes to winter, like dawn becoming dusk. The sun appears in the dawn and it disappears in the night. Human beings grow young and old to death. The paradoxical experience of life the poet has captured is this. What nurtures growth also causes death, that is the beauty of life. The young man is aware of the changing wheel of year, day and the moment that is the twilight of human life. We may have a span of one year or we may have a span of 50 years, 70 years, 80 years, we may have a month, a week or a day, we may have hours we may have minutes, we may, may, we may have seconds, we may have moments. All these change one after another. Finally, the moment of death is something which the poet is trying to capture in this particular sonnet. The speaker's death is the young man's loss. The speaker is interested in the welfare of the young man he wishes him well. So, it is a loss for the young man, but the love from the young man is strong for the poet. Probably the mutual love relationship between the two is strong enough and that strength of love, even that strength of love cannot defeat death. Only the poet can write about his strong love, his affection for his friend. We find metaphor predominantly throughout the poem, because it uses a number of images. It deals with the seasonal change in yellow leaves, boughs in trees shaking against cold wind and also it refers to ruined choirs in a church probably, where sweet birds sang. 
the day changes into night like the old speaker turning into twilight and also we find the fire of the youth is changed to the ashes of old age. So, physically and naturally the change takes place from birth to death. In between something happens that is breeding, the young man was not listening. So, at least in poetry the poet captures the young man now <coughs> and elsewhere also. The paradox we find in this poem is nourishment is also consumption. So, there is not much of a distinction between construction and destruction or production and destruction. Associated devices are personification and symbol. These objects of nature symbolically convey the message, they all together create a strong image of the destruction of time. Like every other Shakespearean sonnet, it has three quatrains and a couplet and the similar rhyme scheme we have A B A B C D C D E F E F and G G. The rhyming words are behold hang cold sang day rest away rest fire lie expire by strong long. The strength of relationship between the two is strong and, and long and that is continued in the poem as well. We also look at some run on lines, cesura and end stop lines in this sonnet. Here we have the first quatrain. That time of year thou mayest in me behold, when yellow leaves are none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bare ruined choirs where laid the sweet bird sang. We have indicated the run on lines through one symbol from behold to when from do hang upon. The sesura is indicated through commas in different places and the end stop lines at the end of lines we have comma and also full stop. This famous poem from Shakespeare moves from outer natural seasonal changes to human physical internal changes which finally take the shape of this old age and death. The aging and dying speaker recognizes that the young man loves him though he must leave him when he dies. The alternating rhyme scheme emphasizes the change of seasons through the various images of leaves, boughs, choirs, birds and sounds of decay into silence of the black night which is referred to as death's second self in the poem. The speaker's loss of life is compensated by the gain of love from the young man for the poet and it is a gain for readers as well because of such deep profound love for yeah, another person or imaginary person Shakespeare could write poems for us. We come to yet another famous poem from Shakespeare. Sonnet 116. Everyone would love to read this poem, remember this poem, recite this poem, probably discuss, think about it very often in their life. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempest and is never shaken. It is a star to every wandering bark, whose dwarth is unknown although his height be taken. Love is not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I never read nor no man ever loved. It is a very simple poem, but it conveys a 
the profound meaning of love, unaltered, unalterable, idealistic love from Shakespeare. The rhyme scheme here we have, we will see it a little later. Love is the predominant theme in this poem. It is a platonic love, idealistic love, unaltering love, unchanging love. But then we also have the contrast with changing love or changing something which is subject to change. We also have the contrast between untruthful love and truthful love. Most importantly, we have the contrast between marriage of minds and marriage of bodies. As we can see, the marriage of body can change. In the sense, bodies can be subject to time, but this idea of marriage of minds is eternal because even after death, this marriage of minds might be strong enough to continue. Therefore, the poet says, true love has no impediments, no obstacles, no problems. But the same Shakespeare may say in another context, the course of true love never runs smooth. True love does not change according to seasons. That is what we find in this particular poem. It is like a guiding star for sailors. It is beyond the onslaught of time as it remains truth until the last day that is the judgment day. If this were to be wrong, that is an error, no one would have loved at all, no one would have written poems like this. There are many poetic devices in this sonnet, metaphors we find in the case of lighthouse and ships, north star and sailors. There is a kind of never changing particular point for ships and sailors. We also have personification in the case of times fool and sickle. Two words are repeated often in this poem, love and alter, love does not alter. That is the whole idea of this poem. We also have an inversion in the first lines, first to two lines actually. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Normally, we would say, let me not admit impediments to the marriage of true minds. It is remarkable that Shakespeare has used four nots, two nevers, two nos, and one nor within this short poem of 14 lines. So, why did he do that? Is there any meaning out of it? We can say that this is a rhetorical strategy used by the poet to define love, but how does he define? Is it only through negation? What is the actual meaning of negation? That is where Helen Wendler says, Shakespeare is actually using the rhetorical strategy of rebuttal. Probably he is refuting his own idea of that the course of true love never runs smooth. He is refuting his own previous idea. The diction is very, very common, mostly monosyllabic words, nothing great about it, but there is lot of greatness about the love that Shakespeare has defined and described in this poem. As usual, we have three quatrains and a couplet in this sonnet. The rhyme scheme is common A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F and G, G. The rhyming words are minds love, finds remove, mark shaken, bark taken, cheeks come, weeks doom, proved loud. The alternating rhymes do not alter true love as they are enclosed in the couplet proved and loved. We have run on lines, we have pauses in, in the name of Sesura. We also have end stop lines in this poem. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. So, at the end we have end stop line 
in, in terms of this colon and comma, the poet is able to convey the unaltering love through these strategies. This famous sonnet, one of the most anthologized sonnets, in this the poet argues strongly that true love is possible and desirable whatever may happen in the world. There are many unchanging guideposts like the lighthouse and the north star to maintain true love until the doomsday. Time can only destroy the body, not the true love. The poet uses ordinary words, metaphors, but he uses unusual emphatic negatives to strengthen the claim of his statement that true love is tr always true, it does not change at all. We come to the third and last poem that we have chosen to discuss as part of this Elizabethan poetry, as part of Shakespearean sonnets, sonnet 144. Two loves I have of comfort and despair, which like two spirits do suggest me still, the better angel is a man of right fair, the worse a spirit a woman colored ill, to win me soon to hell my female evil, tempteth my better angel from my side, and would corrupt my saint to be a devil, we his purity with her foul pride, and whether that my angel be turned a fiend, suspect I may, yet not directly tell, but being both from me, both to each friend, I guess one angel in another's hell, yet this shall I never know, but live in doubt, till my bad angel fire my good one out. Again, we have this contrast between love and death, comfort and despair, better angel and worse spirit, heaven and hell, man and woman, purity and impurity, saint and sinner friend and fear, faith and doubt, good and evil. These binaries are brought into the triangle of a man, his friend and a woman. The speaker has both faith and doubt in the loyalty of his two angels, but both these angels are his angels. Surprisingly, he claims them as my bad angel, my good angel. Even when the angel is bad, he says my bad angel. The good and bad angels have come together. As a result, the speaker feels left out and that is where he finds himself desperate. They have come together, leaving me alone, what will I do? who will respect me, recognize me, why did they do this to me? That is how Shakespeare the poet feels about the triangular situation. Here are some poetic devices, hyperbaton is what we find in the first two lines. Two loves I have of comfort and despair, normally we would say I have two loves of comfort and despair how do they go together is a problem, but this is what we find in life, that is why life is contradictory and full of paradoxes. Shakespeare uses two similes like two spirits, the spirits are angels, one is good angel, another is bad angel, that is the devil. He also metaphorically refers to these angels in terms of man and woman. We also have the metaphor of wooing, the idea of courting between this better angel and worse angel. Another common device that we find in poems is the syncope, where the sounds are omitted as in turn, nar. We have the common structure of sonnet in this poem, three quatrains and a couplet we have, the rhyme scheme is similar A B A B C D C D E F E F and G G. The rhyming words are 
despair, still, fair, ill, evil, side, devil, pride, fear, tell, friend, hell, doubt, out. How beautifully doubt is ousted by the poet, that is what he wishes, but he is unable to confirm it. That is where if you if you pay attention to the rhyming words, you may find some interesting meanings in these poems. We have an I rhyme that means, in sound they do not really match, but they look similar evil devil V I L E V I L they look similar, but when we say evil and devil they are different. We have Sesura, run on lines and end stop lines. To win me soon to hell, we have a pause. My female evil tempted my better. It goes on continuously. My female evil tempted my better angel from my side. We have end stop line at the end. There is a comma, of course, that is a pause. We have extra syllables in line number 4. 5 and 7, if you count them you can see some more additional syllables. Though we have an iambic pentameter in this sonnet, there is some variation of trochee in line number 6 and 8. This is again one of the greatest two poems of Shakespeare, two loves I have, one of comfort, another despair. So, the poet says the speaker's two loves are a friend and a mistress, one is a good angel, another is a bad angel. These two angels good and bad like each other and leave out the speaker causing him the agony of separation from both friendship and love. He has no way of finding out what goes on between the two angels until the friend is thrown out by the mistress that means the mistress is unreliable, she may throw out the friend. Relationships are complex, hence people live in constant fear and doubt about their relationships even with close friends, that is why life is both comic and tragic. But the doubt will be found out sooner or later, how long can you play with this faith and doubt? truth will come out one day. True love alone can save people from the hell of life as the poet says in sonnet number 116. Shakespeare wrote his sonnets in one of the darkest periods of his life when the theatres were closed, when he could not write plays for the theatre. He used a particular format called Shakespearean sonnet and this sonnet came to be identified as Shakespearean because he used this form, format in 154 sonnets. Maybe some variations are there, but majorly they have this format. We also found that these sonnets have 154 sonnets divided into two groups dealing with the fair youth and the dark lady breaking away from the Elizabethan convention of addressing a chaste virtuous woman in sonnet sequences. We read two poems from the first group, sonnet number 12 about time and procreation, sonnet number 15 about poetry for immortality. We examined in detail three poems, sonnet number 73 about time and mortality, sonnet number 116 about true love and sonnet number 144 dealing with the theme of betrayal in relationships, infidelity in relationship between men and women and these are strong emotions that Shakespeare has dealt with in his sonnets and the strongest emotions have found profound expressions in Shakespearean sonnets so sweetly, so mellifluously 
so memorably and readers all over the world love to read them again and again. We have some references which may, you may find useful. One special reference you might like to look into is the last one Helen Wendler's article on Shakespeare sonnets reading for difference. This idea of reading for difference is a critical strategy that we are using in our course on poetry to indicate how poets differ from one another, how poems differ from one another although they may use the same language, the same poetic convention, the same poetic form and all the same poetic theme, but they do differ from each other because of this writing for difference and we understand that because we read for difference. Thank you.